Patience was amazing, waiting while my heart was wandering. Your kindness is surprising as I stumble home. You run to me. I'm welcomed with rejoicing, wrapped in the embrace of royalty. Now I'm overflowing, singing of the love I have received. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Jesus, I adore. to that. We are glad you are with us this morning. 
Welcome to our worship service here from the Journey Church in Longmont, Colorado. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. We are here to raise up the name of Jesus, to worship him, to show our love for him as we did in that first song. I want to thank my awesome son, Jared, and his amazing wife, Emily, for being here with us this morning. Very glad they're here with us. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 145. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. So this morning, let's sing of God's goodness.
God, we are here this morning to celebrate your goodness. You are an amazing God, and we come together wherever we are with this singular intent of being able to connect with you and worship you because of how amazingly good you are. And so God, end this next hour together. We pray that through the power of your Spirit that connects us and draws us all together wherever we are, that it will focus our attention on you and you alone. Because we are gathered, God, for you. To meet you in this moment. And so, Lord, our hearts are turned towards you, and we pray that you will allow us to encounter you, to draw us close to you, and for us to find our peace and our being in you this morning. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It is really good to be with you this morning. As you may have figured out by now, we are actually pre-recording this service because in a little bit, you're going to have an opportunity to be able to hear from Laura DeGroat herself. Laura DeGroat is the author of the book that we've been using as a jumping off point uh, for this summer's series, Laura's book, Live Wide Awake. And just, I'm really excited personally to be able to allow you to be able to hear what God has to say through Laura this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm doubly excited for this weekend uh, for two reasons. Doubly, two, yeah, got it. Doubly excited for two reasons. The first reason is because Will and Josie are getting married this weekend, and that is why we're actually, it's one of the reasons why we're recording early. That created the opportunity for Laura to be able to do the recording of her message for this morning and for you to be able to hear from her and from her heart. I love this because if there was a chapter that I couldn't preach this morning or what I would have preferred not to, it's this one. The title of the chapter for this week was Becoming a Mother. And uh, I love being a dad, but I would have a hard time becoming a mom. So, but, but one of the reasons I was happy to have Laura use this chapter as her chapter is because uh, it came out of one, probably one of the most difficult times in her life when she and JR lost triplets. Uh, a difficult, devastating, and dark time. And yet in the middle of that time, God showed up uh, and spoke to her for the first time. So i uh, just excited to be able to have Laura be with us this morning. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Before we get into that, though, we do have a couple of announcements that I want to make sure that you are aware of. First of all, Starting next week, July 5th, we are actually opening up to uh, gathered worship. We've done the last two weeks with 25, and starting July 5th, we're actually going to be starting uh, for 50. So based on all the calculations of space and everything else, we are uh, allowed to be able to have 50 in our space. But in order to do that and set it up properly, we still would like to be able to have you sign up. So in this week's Journey Jottings, if you haven't noticed it already, there is a link to the sign-up for the next month worth of services. Uh, we have some flexibility with that because, you know, we've got the space here in the sanctuary and some in the lobby if we need it. So don't be shy about signing up, but we would prefer that you sign up ahead of time. That way it helps us uh, figure out getting back into this new normal. One of the things we also want to say, though, is that obviously what's going on in our country and in our own county is pretty fluid. So this is what we hope to be doing moving ahead for the time being. If things change, we will let you know uh, as soon as we know. Also want to let you know something very important that came out in Journey Jottings this week, and that is the 2020-2021 ministry spending plan. That's what we call our budget. Uh, we don't call it a budget because a budget implies saving money and this is a ministry spending money, so that's what we're looking for. So it's just, we've just approved it uh, this past Wednesday night at Lead Team. It's a little late getting out to all of you. We usually try to get that out uh, a couple of weeks before this, but we run a July, June fiscal year. So that's in your, uh, in your inbox through Journey Jottings. And then in two weeks, on July 12th, after our morning service, we're going to have a combination live and Zoom call to be able to get your affirmation of that 2020-21 ministry spending plan. So make sure you have an opportunity to take a look at it. If you have any questions about that, talk to any one of your lead team members, uh, particularly Brent Rollman or myself. 
All right, speaking of money, we also have an opportunity every week to continue to give our gifts and our offerings. And with that, one of the things that we do is we give 10%, what we call our first fruits giving. We give that uh, to organizations outside the journey or affect people outside the journey. This week, we are giving it to the shelter fund. So shelter, as you may remember, has gone year-round because of where Boulder County Navigation Systems. So this facility continues to get used Sunday through Wednesday uh, to help out our homeless neighbors who are seeking to get into permanent housing. So that's where our 10% is going this week. With that, just a reminder, you are able to be able to uh, give via online giving. That's at our website. You go to website journeyoflongmont.org. You'll see a little button up there, giving it. Click to that. It brings you to the giving page. Hit the giving and connects you to that. There's also an opportunity to be able to text to give. And that number will actually be on the last slide uh, of the service today if you want to be able to wait for that. You can also just simply send it here to the journey at 2000 Pike Road, Unit A, Longmont, Colorado, 80501. Or if you come next week on July 5th, you can drop it in the back boxes like we normally do. So lots of opportunities and options there. With that, thank you. Thank you for the way that you've continued to support uh, the journey and what goes on around here and out in the, the community because of your giving. Thank you so much. And then finally, we want to be able to wrap up with some prayers. Uh, this week, as we do every week, we pray for two churches, one that's local here in Longmont and one that's a part of our Christian Reformed uh, sister of churches here in our region. The first one that we're praying for here in Longmont is Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Bethlehem Lutheran is... Uh, west of Maine on 15th, and they've been around a long time in this town. And so we pray for them this, this morning. And then we also pray for Kamir Christian Reformed Church, which, in, which is in Aurora. And Kamir is a, a people group uh, and so it, it, out of Cambodia, and it is a, a group of immigrants that meet together uh, in Aurora. And so we are glad to be able to be praying for our sister church, Kamir Christian Reformed Church. We also have just a couple of updated prayer requests and I want you to be aware of these things because uh, we've got some pretty significant ones coming up. Uh, Chris and Josanne Weirich's grandson, Hudson, had to have his schedule, his surgery scheduled several times because of the COVID epidemic. And since we're recording this on Thursday, we're hoping that by the time you hear this on Sunday, it will have been a sex, sex, successful surgery. It's a pretty significant one. It's a bilateral femoral derotation, osteotomy, I can't, osteotomy, okay, it's, it's in your prayer section, go ahead and read it. So it's a six-hour surgery uh, in which they're going to be realigning his legs and his hips, so pretty significant, so we'll be praying about that and praying for recovery. We also want to be praying for Ken and Tara's 95-year-old grand, uh, father. Uh, Ken's dad uh, is in rehab for hip surgery, and he and his siblings have to be able to make some decisions for his care. He's doing well. He's 95. He wants to get home, but they've got to be able to figure out what that looks like. So prayer for Ken and his siblings that they've got to make some decisions about dad and pray for Ken's dad. And then two praises. Uh, Brian Williams have, has received several jobs. We were praying about that for Brian. He's a handyman, and so he has received several jobs. So praise God for that. And then as well, uh, Scott Elwanger, I'm sorry, uh, Peter Raymer's mom, we pray, we've been praying about uh, getting in with her physiotherapist, and things seem to be working well. Her pain is diminishing. One final prayer request, Scott Elwanger's um, co-worker's mom, we've been praying for her. Uh, her cancer has uh, metastasized into her hips and her back. So... Bad news on that, and we pray uh, for Renee. Well, with all of that, my friends, uh, I'm going to just take an opportunity to pray, and then we're going to turn this over to Laura, and we anticipate uh, expectantly what we have to hear from God through her. So pray with me. God, thanks again for this morning and an opportunity to be able to, to be together with you. And now this morning, Lord, we pray that you open up our hearts to be responsive to what you want us to hear and see through what Laura has to say. 
God, it's been amazing through this entire series how uh, it's just been so appropriately lined up how you are matching what we're going through in this world with what Laura has written over the course of the last couple of years. And so now this morning to be able to hear from you again through yet another one of your servants. So, Lord, may we hear well from you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. How are you this week? Are you guys enjoying the slow expansion of seeing your people face to face, even in smaller groups? Are you enjoying the out of doors and the things that you do outdoors that revive your soul and restore your soul? Are you listening and reading and asking good questions of the friends and family and people of color whose narrative and story needs to be heard right now in a new way. Me too. I'm Laura DeGroote and the author of the book Live Wide Awake and it is really exciting for me to be part of what you're doing here sort of live <laughs> and listen together and look at what God is up to. I'd like to start by asking you to use your imagination, which you, if you've read any part of my book, you know that I try to help you engage that from time to time. But this exercise shouldn't be hard at all. Imagine yourself on a road trip. Maybe you've gone on one or are hoping to go on one yet this summer. And as you imagine yourself on this road trip, um, think about where you're sitting in the car. Are you the driver? Are you in the front seat because you get sort of car sick and so you always get to sit in the front seat, maybe on the passenger side? Or are you all spread out in the back and you're ready for a good car nap or read some books or just sit and watch the world go by and let things slow down for a while? I don't know. Think about that for a minute. And then imagine the part of the trip where you are quiet enough to notice this church off in the distance. It's, you're, you're coming towards it. And what you notice, first of all, is it seems like there's a lot of growth around the church, like maybe too many weeds or high grasses. And then you notice that it seems like the paint is peeling on the church and you get the impression that there probably isn't anybody that has been in that church for a while. And as you get closer and closer, you see something on the roof of the church and realize that there's words. And so you kind of sit up and lean forward as you get closer to the church. And as you go by, you notice the words, God is, and then the treetops of, uh, the tops of these really tall trees cover up whatever the next word is. And then you go on by. And it strikes you, this church where it seems like nobody is and no one's paying attention to that has this partial sentence painting on the top of its roof. And you wonder, what did it say underneath where the trees were? God is fill in the blank. If you had to fill in that blank, what would you say? What would your word or your words be? God is today. If you were painting the rest of that roof or you knew what it said underneath there, what would you say God is? There is an artist's rendition of that actual photo. I know somebody who took an actual photo that that actually happened to on an actual road trip. And I have the photograph and I gave it to the uh, artist in residence of my book, April Bowen, and asked her for a rendition of that photograph. And so on page 86, if you have the book, you'll see this picture. God is, and then the trees blocking whatever else it says. And it begins, that photo begins the second section of this book, which is know who God is. The first section was love who you are. And the second section is know who God is. And I wonder if any of you have thought, why didn't she put that first? Why didn't she put the section on know who God is first. 
And even the story that I'm going to tell you today, which is the title of the chapter called Becoming a Mother, um, that could have been the first story in this book. And this section could have been the first part of this book, but it's not. It's in the center. It's in the heart of the book, if you will. And really, the reason why I wrote the book because I want everybody to know God and not just know about God, right? I want them to know God, not just know about God. And this story that I'm going to tell you, even though maybe you've read it already or you've heard it already from me even, is the story that is pivotal in my identity. It's pivotal in my spiritual formation, pivotal in the change for me from knowing a lot about God or knowing a little about God to really beginning to know God. And it's in the center of the heart of the book. The story of becoming a mother for me might even be called a life-saving story. In the same way that you've maybe read Peter's story in Matthew 14 where Jesus literally saves Peter's life when he's on some really rough waters walking and he begins to drown and he cries out for help and Jesus instinctively and immediately reaches down and grabs his hand. And in this story of becoming a mother, I would tell you that in the same way, I cried out for help from a really desperate place. And God immediately and instinctively used his voice to speak to me. I'm going to tell you the story again, though you may have already read it, but I'd like to tell it to you with maybe a few extra details. So there was only one thing in my life that I knew I wanted to do when I grew up, and that was to be a mother. Now, I may have considered a few other things when I was younger. Like, I did, I do remember thinking about being a truck driver, and that may have had something to do with, like, boys in my class who all wanted to be a truck driver, so I thought that was kind of a good idea, which, of course, it would not have been. I don't even like driving. I had also thought about the idea of, like, being somebody who cuts hair and does nails and... Um, that also for me would not have been a very good idea. You're welcome that I didn't ever cut your hair. Um, but I knew for sure that I wanted to be a mother. I was the first or am the first of five children. And the story in our family goes that my mom always wanted to have 10 children. But after she had me, who was first, that she decided to only have five children. And the reason for this could be spun in any kind of a way. You could spin it saying like, because she had me and I was a strong-willed child and kind of a lot, she thought that five would probably be as many as she could handle because I was maybe the equivalent of more than one. Or you could spin it this way, which is my favorite, to say that I was so extra wonderful that she just didn't feel the need for 10 whole kids, that five was going to be enough. So I can say to my mom these days, either you're welcome or I'm sorry, depending on the way she wants to spin the story. Needless to say, when I got married to the man that my mom picked out for me, JR, I told him that I really wanted to be a mother. And his suggestion was that we try being just married for a while first. A year later, after we had been married for a while, in my opinion, and we bought a house, I suggested again, maybe it was time to become a mother, and he suggested we try a dog. And I will say this, uh, raising a puppy is not bad a bad experience to have before trying to raise a child. There, there are some good character building things that can come out of that, for sure. And it would probably be close to another year or so later that we decided that now was the time to have children become parents. Only that took a lot longer than we were expecting. But when I finally found out that I was pregnant and I went in to confirm it with JR and they did an ultrasound, 
they found out that we were going to have a whole family all at once. Three babies, also called triplets. Now, I was already laying down, so when I got that information, I mean, it was, sh it was shocking for sure. But JR, they had to like find a place for him to sit down because that was a that was a lot of information to take in all at once, and he didn't feel very good when they told us that. Anyway, I spent a lot of time thinking about, planning for, imagining what it was going to be like to raise a family all at once, to get all the kids all at once. What I didn't plan for was what would happen. And that would be that at 23 weeks and five days, due to some complications, I would deliver those babies, Calvin and Leah and Andrew, all weighing one pound and having all the parts that babies are supposed to have and even all crying. They didn't live very long. That day, we said hello and goodbye to them. And I never planned for or thought about or expected or imagined having to say goodbye to my children the same day they were born. I won't ask you in the book, nor will I hear um, to imagine that either. But some of you might be able to imagine your own grief from your own loss and can remember what that experience was like for you after the first few moments or hours or days or weeks or months into it when it seemed like no one else was remembering and that's all you could think of. For me, about six months into that, I found myself at a crossroads and I tell you this story because I've got lots of hindsight, but what I knew then that I now know more of now, but what I knew then was that I definitely was about to choose a life of bitterness and I felt like I would be very justified in saying there's no God there's no such thing he doesn't make sense in this scenario not the God that I know about and I was ready to let go of all of that and bury this pain and bitterness and anger and choose that life I knew that that's where I was headed and on this particular day I went out for a walk with my dog in a field I'd been many many times and I shook my fist and I screamed into the air, if you're for real, what in the expletive do you want with me? And immediately and, extinct and instinctively, the God who is spoke to me so clearly. By, and he said this, I want all of you. If you're for real, what do you want with me? I want all of you. That's what he said. And I can tell you that I did not know what those words meant. And I can tell you I heard that voice as clear as if someone was standing next to me and said that to me. And I can tell you that I did not know God that would speak to me like that. But that pivotal moment did more than one thing but the first being that I would not choose the life of bitterness, but I would instead choose a life of joy and it would begin by going after God. Who would say something like that to me to get to know God and eventually understand what it would mean that he would want all of me? Years later, I would realize that those words, I want all of you, aren't just for me. They came to me and I received them and learned to lean into them and still am. But they were meant to also go through me and I want to say to you today, those words are for you too. And I'm not the only one who's ever heard those words and understood those words and speaks from those words. I'm going to read to you a story, a song actually, from someone else who has. And it's in this book, not the Live Wide Awake book, but this book. And if you have one with you or close to you, you can get it and open this living word up to kind of the middle of your Bible. And it usually will open up to the Psalms. And if you can find number 103, that's where 
I'm going to read to you from today. Or you can find it on one of your devices, that's fine. You're welcome to also just listen to it. So this Psalm 103 is written by King David. He was king at this point. And it's said that he probably wrote this psalm when he was in the later part of his life. And so I like to think about David writing this from a lot of life experience and having um, a lot of time knowing God and not just knowing about God, but really knowing God, personal experience with that. And he begins and he ends this psalm with, the same kind of words about, um, I want all of you, and speaking out of that. He begins and he ends uh, this psalm with the same sentence. And depending on what translation you look at or are reading from, you might read the words, all that I am, let all that I am, or let my inmost being, or with my whole heart, or from my head to my toes, let all of who I am praise the Lord. That's where he begins and that's where he ends. And because I've studied David's life too, what, what you'll know even if you read a little bit about David is he was musical and he danced and that is um, written for us many times. So I also can picture David writing this song, singing this song, teaching this song, um, singing this song in his community of people by raising his hands, they were in the air and his body would be in motion. So maybe you can have that image of this too when we read it. But before I do, I want to pose this question. Why would David, why would I, why would you say yes or give all of ourselves to God? Why would we praise him with our inmost being? Why would we want to? Why would we be able to? Why would we say yes? Why would we give him our all? I mean, if you think about it, I, I know for me, there are a very small amount of people in my life that I give all access to. Uh, my husband, my daughters, my mother, a few close friends, and they've had to earn that. They've had to be loyal and faithful and forgiving and loving. They've had to prove to me that they have the capacity for my vulnerability. And in the same way, they have had to extend an all access pass to me too, um, to receive from them the same things. And even then, none of them have 100% all access to all of me, which is what God asks us for. So, who is God and what does he do that we can praise him with everything and trust him with our whole being and give him an all-access pass to us? Well, now let's read this psalm and see what David has to say about what God is up to. Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. And may I never forget, or maybe your version says, may I remember the good things he does for me. He forgives my sins. He heals my diseases. He redeems me from death. He crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life, like fills my life, with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness. The Lord gives justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate. He's merciful. He's slow to get angry. And he's filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us. He will not remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. And he has removed our sins so far from us, as far as the east is from the west. 
Because as a father who has compassion on his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he knows how weak we are, he remembers we're like dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and then the wind blows and we're gone as though we had never been here before. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him and his salvation extend to their children's children, of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. The Lord has made the heavens his throne and from there he rules over everything. So praise the Lord, you angels, you who mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commandments. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all of his kingdom. And let all that I am praise the Lord. Who is God? And what does he do that David could praise him and trust him and obey him and honor and give all of his being to him? Well, David remembers what God is up to and what God was up to. And so in the beginning, he talks about how God is giving and forgiving. And I wondered about what specifically David was remembering in his life, what specific diseases he had been healed from, what specific things God had forgiven him for, what specific seasons of life he had known such abundance of blessing and love and good things at what times in his life did he feel like his he was re-energized by the presence of God by the presence of people that God sent to his life for all kinds of different reasons in all kinds of different times and then he moves to the story about the Lord giving righteousness and justice to these people and he talks about how God is fighting for and rescuing. He remembers that. And he remembers the greater part of the story that he lives in by remembering history and God saving and rescuing the lives of people, a whole people group who were slaves. And all at once, he would remove them from slavery. And even in the chaos of leaving and going somewhere that they didn't know where that would be, going toward a promise, leaving slavery and moving toward freedom, they would get to learn how to live as free people. And then they would come to the place where they would get to live a place meant for them, a place that was good, a place where they could be free. David was remembering that story, and if you need to remember it too or read it for the first time, you can go to Exodus. And specifically, Exodus 14 has a pretty epic story, although it's all epic, but this is a pretty epic story of when they had all left, all of these people, this giant people group, and they know that the people who they were slaves to have changed their mind and are coming after them, and they're standing in front of a body of water. Things aren't looking so good. And in that moment, Moses, who knows that God is, tells the people this. Don't be afraid. Just stand and watch the Lord rescue you today. The, Egyptian, the Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Can you imagine? David was remembering that story that God is fighting for and saving, rescuing his people. David was also, in the next few verses from like 8 to 12, he is remembering the big picture that God is loving and forgiving and that 
the way that he loves is vast and immeasurable and monumental. That the way that he has to come up with a measurement for it is east to west and heaven to earth. Like we can't measure that. We can't hardly even wrap our hand. We probably can't wrap our heads around that. And so he remembers this big picture of God's marvelous love, his monumental love. And then he remembers how God is also very specific and very personal, like a father would know his own child, like a mother would know her own son and daughter. And that in that, his love is so tender and compassionate. And he would know us inside and out. He would know all of us from head to toe because he is the author of us and the expert lover of us. He knows how fragile we are. I think that that's a really interesting, specific thing David remembers about God. Who God is is that he remembers how fragile we are, how weak we are. And I thought, we don't really like to think of ourselves as weak. We would prefer to think of ourselves as strong and capable and in control and that we really do know in general we're pretty right about what we know about how we perceive and understand people and circumstances um, we think we may be immune to certain disparities or failure or diseases and you know if the pandemic and the protests have not challenged that about the way you think or see yourself I'm not really sure what will. I know it certainly has for me. I think this is a really sacred time of reconsidering our weakness. I think this is a really sacred time where we can face our need for help and taking our inmost being, the part maybe we don't show anybody else, and letting God have access to both our desires and to our damaged beliefs and behavior so that we can be people who experience this vast forgiveness of God and come out of hiding and live wide awake. I believe that this is a really sacred time for us to face our weakness and our lack of control and our certainty about that we know what's right and that we understand it all and instead give God an all access pass to that and come out of hiding and be forgiven and live wide awake. I do. All that you are, God wants. He held nothing back from David. He held nothing back from his, the Israelite people we remember. He holds nothing back from us. He doesn't change in that way. He's still the same. And so in the same way, we don't have to hold anything back. We can bring even our doubt. We can bring our anger. We can bring our grief. Bring your money. Bring your relationships. Bring your education, bring your job, bring your responsibilities, bring your parenting, bring your marriage, bring your play, bring your leisure, bring your big dreams, bring your big prayers, bring your big questions, bring your big wounds, bring your talents and your gifts, bring what makes you special, bring what you've worked so hard to be really good at. Bring all that you've accomplished. Bring what comes naturally to you. All access. Give God all of that. Give God, the expert lover of you, access to that. And what happens is that it opens us up for the giving and receiving, for the fighting for and rescuing, and for this vast and monumental love that God is famous for. It is possible that as we read David's song, his psalm, that remembering or not forgetting is the key. That remembering is required for us on a regular basis 
so that we can praise and trust and obey and honor and give one more part of ourselves, give that part back again, right? Because in our remembering, that's where we take um, our own life or the lives of other people, right? Or the life that we've lived and we remember who God is and what God does and what God is up to. And in that remembering, we say, oh yeah, I get to live differently because of who God is. I get to live freely. I get to live wholeheartedly. Here's what that could look like starting this week in your own life. Letting all of who you are remember God, who he is and what he does. This is what it could look like. That you could write or speak or create your own list of the author and expert lover of you and how he has given, forgiven, rescued, monumentally loved you, shown up, been present, that you make your own list as you remember. And now David, we know he was a singer and a songwriter. So the way that he re remembered was by writing a song. Maybe some of you are also people that have words and you use them to write poetry or you use them to write plays or you use them to write letters to people or instruction or story and certainly or maybe your journal that's how you use your words and certainly those are ways that you could write down as you remember and express to God that you know who God is in your life and you know what God does but maybe in these previous weeks when you've looked at who are you You've discovered something about who you are that you maybe didn't think of before. I don't know. I hope so. Um, and maybe you've realized that words aren't your thing, but flower arranging is one of the ways that God has made you unique. And so you could practice remembering who God is and what God does by um, taking the flowers and putting them in a vase. And each, as you put in each stem... You let that represent a specific time of grace or a season of blessing or a profound gift of forgiveness in your life. Maybe um, also in the lives of other people that you've known that have gone before you or in lives of people in your small group, say. Maybe you're somebody who expresses yourself physically and you've realized that's how you often communicate with God is when you're cycling or hiking or biking or walking. And so if that's who you are, when you're out on a bike or a hike or, a, or taking um, uh, a walk, each mile marker you pass or a certain kind of tree that you pass, you use those as prompts to remember who God is and what he has done specifically in your life, uh, but also in the lives of maybe your relatives or a story you read in the Bible or, or something that you've seen in creation. If you're an artist with crayons or pencils or a paintbrush, you could sketch or paint images that express how you remember God's good things in your life, how he's renewed your energy, how he's been life-giving through other people um, or through events or circumstances in your life. Maybe you're a quilter or a crocheter or a knitter or a sewer. You've been making masks lately. And you can let patterns or rows or stitches or fabric combinations be the means of remembering God's vast and specific compassion for you and tender mercy for you, for your tribe of people, for the city that you live in. Maybe you're a baker or a maker of food. And as you put something together, you let each ingredient give you pause to praise God for every single good gift you can come up with that you've enjoyed in your work, that you've enjoyed in your health, that you've enjoyed um, in your relationships, or that you've enjoyed in your leisure, on your vacations. And then when you're finished with whatever you've made or baked, you can let that be an expression of praise as you share it with someone else, your family or your neighbor or somebody that's in need. But let's say you can't do any of that right now. You're just not in a place 
that you maybe believe that or can say any of those things or you don't want to remember, you can't remember, that's okay, that's okay. Here's what you can do. You can go for a walk anyway. And you have permission to talk to God the way you talk. And you just tell him that. You tell him that you can't right now and why you can't right now. And then you listen and you see if God has anything to say back to you. So what is God up to in your life right now? And what do you need to remember? And how will you choose to do that this week? Whatever it is, I pray that it may help you to lean in to giving all of you wholeheartedly to God, who is whatever you will say. I'd like to just finish our time together praising and praying to this Lord who is like a parent to his children and knows us so well. Will you join me? Lord, we give you this day our attention to the words David wrote, pointing out who you are and what you did in his life, in the life of his community and his ancestors, in the life of your created ones in heaven and all of your creation. We remember today that you are the same unchanging God who is compassionate still, merciful still, still not remaining angry forever, still removing our sins from us. We remember you love who you made and what you made, and your love remains. We thank you for the good gifts you filled our life with, and we want to use those gifts to their fullest as a testament to your goodness and for your glory. We confess our forgetfulness, our doubt, our avoidance, our denial, our hiding, our hurt, our clinging to control or confidence in our own rightness. Do you really want that part of us too? Give us the courage to cry out to you from those weak places and thank you for your forgiveness. Be the God who instinctively reaches out and grabs our hand, speaks clearly, and moves mightily to save us. Lord, may each one of us be willing to give you an all-access pass to who we are because we remember you are trustworthy. Let all that we are with our whole hearts, our inmost being from head to toe, praise you now and forever, Lord. Amen. Welcome back, everybody. We're glad you're back here with us to close our worship service. Today, we're going to close in worship with a song that talks about how much God loves us. I hope you enjoy this. I hope you worship to him with it. God's 
so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God. Jesus is waiting, oh God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. That's our confession, Lord. To know that you went to the extent that you did to retrieve us. What a great gift that you give us, Lord. We thank you for meeting us here this morning. We thank you for the words of Laura, for how you have worked in her life to bring her to where she is, to bring these words to us. And we pray, God, that with what has taken place this morning, you'll draw us closer to you and equip us to live in this world in your name. Lord, we lift this to you through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And as you get ready for this week, know this. There isn't a place you can go that you can't hide from God. There's not a place that you can go where he doesn't see you. There's not a place that you can go that you can run away from him because he is always there waiting with open arms to draw you home. So go in his name. Go in his peace and his love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.